الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام The Makki phase, the Meccan phase during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the message of the Prophet ﷺ started uh, as we've been studying since the initial revelation with the first verse of the Qur'an. The majority of the scholars agree was the verse of Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq which followed by three years, three years of secret call, three secret invitation and secret da'wah to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that ended with a proclamation with al-jahru bil-da'wah. And that started the declared phase that lasted for 11 years, 10 to 11 years of, uh, after uh, that phase. And this was characterized by torment, by persecution, by great suffering of the believers, of the early community, of the companions, the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. Major events happened during that time, including the Hijrah, the migration to Al Habasha, to Abyssinia the first and the second wave of immigrants, the uh, help that the Muslims received by two main characters of Islam that entered into this religion, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu an. Quraysh at that time resorted to the siege, to al-Hisar, where they boycotted the believers, they physically uh, trapped them inside uh, a fork in the mountain that belonged to Abu Talib. And there were great years of famine and suffering, social embargo, social and economical embargo against the Muslims. That culminated in the tenth year after the birth, after the message that started the Prophet ﷺ, with the death of Abu Talib, the death of Khadija, the uh, the tribulation of a Taif of the Prophet ﷺ, all happened within three months in one year. That was dubbed the year of sorrow, the year of grief, Amul Huzn. Then the minha, the gift of al-Isra and al-Mi'raj. Then the preludes to al-Hijrah started, where the first Muslims uh, of Yathrib uh, came and, and accepted the call of the Prophet ﷺ in the valley of Mina. That followed a year after that with the first pledge of Aqaba. A year after that was the second pledge of Aqaba. The second pledge of Aqaba was a historical landmark that opened the gates of Hijrah, where the Prophet ﷺ guaranteed by that pledge help and support for those who leave Mecca and enter Yathrib. And when they come to Yathrib, they become in the protection of their brothers who were called Al-Ansar, the supporters of the Prophet ﷺ. Quraysh understood at that time with the very early uh, wave of Hijrah, after the news of the second pledge of Aqaba uh, were common knowledge, and Quraysh knew about it, that they have to fight this. Islam was dangerous in Mecca to them, but it was more dangerous outside Mecca. Islam to be not contained within the city that they govern, that they control, that idea to Quraysh was a, a very dangerous idea. They wanted to contain the Muslims. They wanted to have control over Islam inside of Mecca. Some may say, well, why would Quraysh even bother go to the length of preventing people from Hijrah? They do not like the Muslims. Muslims are creating troubles for them inside of Mecca. So if they want to leave, they should say good riddance. You know, just let them go. There will be less problems in Mecca. Quraysh were aware that actually Muslims will change the society as they know it will change the social order in Arabia and beyond that. They're changing the concepts the, the, that those pagans were raised upon, the, the social order that they're used to. So they wanted to control Islam in Mecca. They wanted to control the spread of Islam. They wanted to prevent the danger of a forming a Muslim entity, a Muslim state in the city of Yathrib. They wanted to preserve their tribal system. Because this community of Muslims was not a tribe, was not a, they did not belong to a certain geographical area. It was faith-based brotherhood. It was faith-based 
link and that kinship of Muslims raised above every other kinship that was known there. Muslims, they, they loved each other. The Sahaba had more closeness to one another than they did for their own families, for their, for their own tribes, for their own clans. And that is something that was unheard of in Arabia. So that, whole, that ruins the whole tribal system that existed in that, in that uh, particular time of history. There was also, to, the, to Quraysh, there was a potential threat for their trade route. Trade route that goes to Sham, that goes to, to, to the area of Syria, Damascus, and all the, the, that, uh, the borders of the Byzantine Empire. That's a, that's a very vital trade route for them. Yathrib falls right within that route. And if Muslims have an entity there that could threaten their trade, that can get to their bottom line, to the money, to the wealth. And that is something they wanted to make sure that that was well preserved. The status of Mecca, according to the pagans, was based on paganism, was based on the idols. To them, the idols that were in Mecca was the sanctuary of Mecca, and that's why Mecca had its own uh, status. So if they lose that by Islam, they figured that they will, their, their trade will have no protection of Arabia, in Arabia. And Allah reminds them, that the, the status that you got, O Quraysh, لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشٍ إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ أَلَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفِ Allah told them, it is not that this house, it is not Mecca and, and the idols in Mecca that, that is feeding you. And that's not what's protecting your trade. And that's not what's giving you security and safety. It is رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ It is the Lord of this house who has given you that. So worship him and worship him alone. But that message went unheeded in, uh, with Quraysh. So they really wanted to control those immigrants and keep them, those Muslims, and keep them from going to Yathrib. And they tried everything. We, we studied how they tried to put pressures on family. They will not allow the wife to go with her husband, like they, what they did with Umm Salama, radiallahu anha when they prevented her husband Abu Salama to take her with him to when he migrated to Yathrib and he had to go alone. She could not catch up with him after a whole year where she was also separated from her own child, from her own son. We saw how they would kidnap people that already made the journey to Yathrib. They would go after them and they would kidnap them and bring them back. They would imprison some of them. They would torture them. They would cause fitna in their heart, and some of them would have to go back to paganism and idol worshiping and leave their allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. And some did, but they repented and went back. Like what happened with Ayyash ibn Rabi'ah and Hisham ibn al-As, who were kidnapped by Abu Jahl himself. And they were uh, entrapped and they, would, they were exposed to fitna inside of Mecca. Some, they were, uh, they would put pressure, pressure was put on them to, to uh, confiscate their wealth, like Suhaib al-Rumi, Suhaib ibn Sinan, where they told him, we will let you go, but you cannot take a thing with you. And he left his entire wealth, his entire belonging, with the pagans of Mecca. The sacrifice that that generation was asked, and they did, was beyond anything that we can imagine or dream of the breaking of the families, the sacrifices of people that they had to sacrifice their life. Now you have to, re to remember that those immigrants did not leave Mecca because the economical situation in Mecca was not conducive to growth. They did not leave Mecca because the opportunities were limited. They did not leave Mecca because there was a problem in Mecca. They left Mecca where they really loved to stay in Mecca. They wanted to stay in Mecca. When the Prophet ﷺ himself was leaving, he was tearing. And he would say, you are the most beloved places on the face of the earth to Allah. And if I was not made to be left, if I was not driven out, I would not leave you. So these Sahaba had passion to Mecca. They would cry for Mecca for, for years when they were in Medina. But they had to leave because of La ilaha illallah. Because that was more dear to, her, to them than anything else. That word, that faith that they had, that kalima they had, was most precious. Was, was, was worth everything. Was worth the family, was worth the wealth, was, was worth home 
was worth what they were born. And that generation is the best generation. And this group of Sahaba are the best of people. Al-Muhajireen. And whenever there is a mention of the believers, when there is a rank, the Muhajireen are mentioned first. That generation, that group of people, we owe them a lot with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second group was the supporters, the helpers of Ansar, who lived up to their promise to the Prophet sallallahu They were the best hosts for those immigrants that came to them. They actually had multiple areas, multiple guest houses if you will. And not only guest houses, but guest clans and guest suburbs of Medina. One of the suburbs called Qiba. Qiba became a center of immigrants that come from Mecca, and many of them would settle in Qiba. And that was the destination of the Prophet ﷺ when he first arrived in Medina, he arrived in Qiba. And he built the very first masjid in Islam, the Masjid of Qiba. And that's why that masjid had a very special status in our religion. And there there was the clan of Banu Amr ibn Awf. And Banu Amr ibn Awf, they received many of the immigrants, many of the muhajireen, amongst them Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, who settled in that area in Qiba when he went there. Another area was Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar of them was Sa'd ibn Zurara. Now Sa'd ibn Zurara radiallahu an was pivotal, has, was an, had played an instrumental role. He was the one that received Mus'ab ibn Umayr and others that brought him and, and allowed them to, uh, to be uh, hosted. And, uh, and, uh, and the houses of Bani Najjar, Uthman ibn Affan was hosted. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was hosted. And even they said they, in the house of Sa'd ibn Khayshama, Sa'd ibn Khayshama was a single man, and all the single men of the Muhajireen would come and be with him. So they had places where the married people would go and settle, but they also had places for the single people. They tried to accommodate everyone, whatever their situation is. Banu Abd al-Ashhal, where Sa'd ibn Mu'adh is from, they also received many of the Sahaba, amongst them Mus'ab ibn Umar eventually settled there with Banu Abd al-Ashhal. And many other houses amongst the Ansar. But Islam started spreading and prospering. Quraysh, Quraysh felt the danger that now the Muslims are forming a real community. And that danger for them, for Quraysh is real. But what they really feared the most, for that community to become the state of Islam that is, it is to become, the leader has to be there. The messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would have to be there. And for Quraysh to really stop this whole thing from happening, they needed to prevent the Prophet sallallahu from leaving Mecca. That was to them, is a very important issue at that time. It was an emergency meeting that was called in Darun Nadwa, in the Congress of Quraysh, in the governing body of Quraysh. A very important emergency meeting to discuss what do we do about this. How can we stop this? The plan was to stop the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this happened about two and a half months after the second pledge of Aqaba. What happened there is the major, the elite so, so called, the, the chiefs of Quraysh got together. And they had representatives to discuss what do we do with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of those people was Abu Jahl ibn Hisham, representing the opposition to Islam, representing the tribe of Makhzum. Jubair ibn Mut'im, Al-Harith ibn Amir, wa Tu'aymat ibn Adi, representing Bani Nawfal, from the clan of Abdul Manaf. Shayba and Utba, the sons of Rabi'a, and Abu Sufyan, representing Bani Abd Shams, tribes of Umayyah. Al Nadr ibn al Harith from Bani Abd al Dar. Abu al Bukhturi ibn Husham from Bani Asad. And others, Umayyah ibn Khalaf from Bani Jamah. So they all agreed to meet and discuss what should we do with 
the situation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now according to Ibn Hisham, as they were sitting there and discussing the situation and what to do about the Prophet, a man, an older man came and wanted to join them. And according to the narration of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, this was Iblis Allah, coming to join the meeting in the form of a man. A man from Najd, the way he dressed and the way he talked, and he said, I want to join you and discuss this with you. So they started talking about this. And Abu Aswad said, we have to let him out. He has caused a lot of trouble to us. He insulted our gods, our idols. And we don't care where he goes. So this elder of Najd said, لا والله ما هذا لكم برأي. This is not a good opinion. أَلَمْ تَرَوْ حُسْنَ حَدِيثِهِ وَحَلَاوَةَ مَنْطِقِهِ وَغَلَبَتُهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِ الرِّجَالِ Can't you say when he talks how he takes the hearts of people? Can't you say the eloquence of his tongue? Can't you see all of these things that come out of, of Muhammad? If you do that, then when he leaves Mecca, then his, his words will spread throughout Arabia. And he will become more dominant. And then there will be one day where he will come and take you over. He will take Mecca over from you. So you should not do that. Abu Bukhturi said, why don't we imprison him? Ihbisuhu fil hadid. Why don't we shackle him, chain him, and just put him in, in prison? Just lock him up. And then wait to happen to him whatever happened to the poets before him. And this is actually, this is in the Quran. Qalu sha'irun natarabbasu bihi rayb al manun. He said he is just not about a poet. Let's just wait for death to come and take him. So we imprison him, we put him in shackles, we lock him up, and then eventually he will die. No, none of us would kill him, because they, were, they feared retaliation from Bani Hashim. They feared that if, if one of them went and killed the Prophet wasallam, then there would be an issue between tribes now. An open war will occur within Quraysh. And that's the last thing, civil war in Quraysh was the last thing that Quraysh wants to have. That's what they wanted to avoid. So Abu al-Bukhturi said, why don't we just lock him up and wait until he dies, so none of us would, would kill him. And the elder that was with them, who was according to Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, who was Iblis himself, he said, if you lock him up, then his words will continue to spread. And he will continue to preach behind the, the locked doors. You know, Quran will continue to come and somehow he will, he will say his words and his companions will, will get that. And they will come and, and rescue him. They might come and just rescue him like they rescued some people that were in prison before. That is not what should happen. Abu Jahl said, I have an opinion. And they said, what is, what it is? What is it? Ya Abu al-Hakam. He said, every tribe brings one of their hardest, fiercest warriors, Shab ben Jaladin, to bring us one solid, strong person. And every clan has to do that. Every single tribe, every single clan in Quraysh will send us one person. And each one will have a sword in their hand. So they go to Muhammad, وسلم, and they hit him one time like one man, and they all kill him with one hit from everyone. So his blood will be spread amongst all the tribes, meaning no retaliation of, of Bani Hashim cannot go towards one clan and another tribe. There will be no alliances, there will be no help from one tribe against the other to retaliate for the blood, the tribal situation that happens for the blood of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He said, نَسْتَرِيحُ مِنْ Then we will, be, we'll, we will be at ease. We'll be comforted after he dies. And his blood, his, the, the retaliation for his blood will be dispersed. And Banu Abdu Manaf, they will not be able to fight everyone. So this elder man, he said, الْقَوْلُ مَا قَالَ هَذَا الرَّجُلُ The word, that what, what happened, this is, what, this is the right opinion. Is this man has the right opinion. 
and he left the place and they all agreed that that is the right opinion. They will bring a man from every tribe and they will decide on a night and they would wait for the Prophet wasallam to leave his house at Fajr time and as he leaves for Fajr they would strike him one time and they will kill him in his home or outside his home. They will just have a plan to end the life of the Prophet and end this religion of Islam. Now that was the plotting of Quraysh. But Allah has a different plan. And Allah has a different plot. Yamkurun wa yamkurullah. Wallahu khayrul nakiri. And Allah is the best planner. Allah is the best plotter. Now we go to Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, again, he said to the believers, إِنِّي أُرِيتُ دَارَ هِجْرَتِكُمْ ذَاتُ نَخْلٍ بَيْنَ لَبَّتَيْنِ I was seeing the place of your immigration has been shown to me. It is a salty land planted with date palms situated between two volcanic mountains, two mountains, al Labba is the dark solid rocks, which is what we know as the volcanic rocks. Uh, and known at that time as Al-Harma. So some people started immigrating, and the people that come from Abyssinia, they went back to Yathrib this time, to Amidi. So Abu Bakr started obeying what the Prophet wasallam has already given permission to the rest of the Sahaba to leave Mecca and go to Yathrib. And he started preparing his ride, preparing his, uh, his uh, journey and his trip. So he came to the Prophet وسلم, and wanted to leave. And the Prophet said, Ala rislik, wait. I am hoping that I will also be given permission to leave. And at that time the Sahaba did not know whether the Prophet وسلم, was going to leave or not. They had a few hints from Bayat al-Aqaba, the Prophet said, if I come to you, if I, you know, would, would I get protection? But at that time, the Sahaba had no idea that the Prophet ﷺ was coming at any particular time. The only person who was given that hint directly was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu And Abu Bakr said, وَتَرْجُوا ذَلِكَ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ وَأُمِّي You really hope so? I give my father and my I give my father sacrifice to you. This is just a figure of speech in Arabia. And the Prophet said, nah, just wait, don't leave. So Abu Bakr, he took two camels and he started preparing two of them. And he would feed them waraq al sumr. And this is just some of the best animal feed that they had available at that time. He just wanted those two camels to be ready for a long journey. And be ready for the best person that would be ride, that would ride on them, that is the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At that time, when the plotters started plotting against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah speaks of that in Surah Al-Anfal. وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ and remember when the disbelievers plotted against you to imprison you or to kill you or to get you out from your home. And these are the three options that were discussed in that meeting according to Sahih ibn Hisham. One said, just let him go. The other said, no, we have to put him in shackles and imprison him. And the third say, we should kill him. Abu Jahl Allah. So Allah says, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ and this is the very, how the, the, the story of history in Ibn Hisham is verified in the Qur'an. But Allah says, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They were plotting, and Allah too was plotting. And Allah is the best of those who plot. When that decision was made to kill the Prophet wasallam, and on that night, where the pagans were the idol worshippers, the kuffar of Quraysh, wanted to kill the Prophet that particular night. Jibreel came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, لا تبت هذه الليلة على فراشك. Do not sleep tonight in your bed, O Muhammad So we go back to Sahih al-Bukhari. This is what happened that particular day. And you see the 
the plans of Allah and then the plans of His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the well planning, the secrecy, the the way that this was executed. It's all lessons for us about how to do things, how to really be well organized and well conducted in our affairs. So Aisha, as narrated, as she spoke in, in, in this hadith, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. She said, one time, we were in the house of my father Abu Bakr, fi nahr al in the heat of noon, of the, 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 the early afternoon, the zenith time. Now you have to understand, this is Mecca, and this is in the summertime, and people don't walk around at noon. It's probably 120 plus degrees, right? 110, 120, very hot. Generally, people are in the shade, taking their uh, rest at that time. So she said, "Fi nahr al Nahr is this area, right? So it is in the in the top, really. It's in the in the top of the day. So it is maybe 1, 12, 1, between 12 to 1, 2 o'clock. If you've been in Mecca in June or July, you know what I'm talking about. You just don't walk around at that time. So that's when the Prophet ﷺ walked, came to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And he came, mutaqanni'an. He came and he was covering his face. So no one can tell who that is. So the Prophet came, he was masked to the house of Abu Bakr. Look how, how, you know, this is the best person who makes tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jibreel himself has come to tell him what to do and how to be protected that night. Yet he's taken every precaution. He's doing everything he can to have the protection and the preservation and to do the well planning. Because that's what Muslims do. We rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we do our best in what we're trying to achieve. So he came at a time where no one walks around, and he covered his face, he came uh, in a mask, mutaqanni'an, he was veiled. And she said, fi sa'atin lam yakun ya'tina fiha. At a time that he usually does not come to us. And the Prophet wasallam had a habit, it is narrated in books of history and some hadith, that he used to go visit the house of his friend Abu Bakr, of his Sahaba Bakr, sometimes twice a day. But a lot of time, it's early in the morning and late in the afternoon, in the evening time. He would always come and check on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. This was our prophet. So Abu Bakr said, فَدَى لَهُ أَبِي وَأُمِّي وَاللَّهِ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ فِي هَذِهِ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا أَمْرُ My father and my mother be sacrificed for him. Again, a figure of speech. Is, this is the most dear, this is the dearest person to me. I would give everything for him. That's what it means. He wouldn't come to me at this time of the day unless there is something serious. So she said, فَجَاءَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَاسْتَأْذَنْ Again, we're narrating from Sahih al-Bukhari. So the Prophet asked permission before he entered. فَأَذِنَ لَهِ And he allowed him, he gave him permission to come. Now, this is the best of creation. When he comes to a house, he asks permission to come. He gives salam to the people. This is the manners of the Prophet ﷺ. Every word in this hadith is a lesson. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ لِأَبِي بَكْرِ أَخْرِجْ مَنْ عِنْدَكَ So Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr, let whomever is in the house leave. Whomever in that room, leave. And Abu Bakr said, إِنَّمَا هُمْ أَهْلُكَ بِأَبِي وَأُمْ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ This is your family. Ya Rasulullah. What does that mean? Aisha has already been given in marriage to the Prophet ﷺ. The contract of marriage of nikah has been made to the Prophet ﷺ. Because her nikah was uh, performed in Mecca. It was consummated in Medina. So he said, this is your wife, Ya Rasulullah. There is just your family here. There's, you know, if you want them out. So the Prophet continues. And he said, إِنِّي قَدْ أُذِنَ لِيَ فِي الْخُرُوجِ I was given permission to leave. So, Abu Bakr said, أَصْصُحْبَةُ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Can I accompany you? Is it my company with you? And, and the Prophet ﷺ said, نعم. Yes, you will be my companion on this journey. In another hadith, Aisha said, I never knew and I never thought that anyone, anyone can cry from happiness until I saw my father crying that day. 
the tears just poured from the eyes of Abu Bakr Siddiq, just happiness that he would be the companion of the Prophet ﷺ on that particular journey. Now you understand the depth of that? This was the most dangerous journey you can ever take. You are, being a, you are going to accompany the person that the entire Quraysh is going to go follow and kill. He knew that. Right? This was the most, this is the one person, if you're really concerned about your own life, that's the first person you just don't want to travel with. Right? That's the one person that you don't want to be with. And he was pouring tears out of happiness. Meaning he was, not only he didn't even hesitate not once, he was so happy that this would happen. Whatever happens, he doesn't know they're going to make it there or not. He doesn't know if they're going to survive the journey or not. He was just happy that he was chosen by the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be, to, to be his companion on that journey, whatever the consequences are. And the tears were pouring out of his eyes. Radiallahu anhu. That's why Abu Bakr is Abu Bakr. The iman, the faith that he has, the degree of sacrifice. This is like someone asking you, you said, you know, I want you to go with me on a journey, likelihood that you're probably going to get killed. And you just don't, you know, most people that want to sacrifice, they say, okay, I'll go with you. But to cry out of happiness, because this is going to happen, that's iman now. That's true love to the Prophet wasallam, And true love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, خُذْ بِأَبِي أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِحْدَى رَاحِلَّتَ يَهَاتَيْ So, O Prophet of Allah, take one of these two camels, whichever one you want. He has already prepared two camels. He was feeding them the best feeds and preparing them for his beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And the Prophet answered in the most beautiful way. He said, بِالثَّمَن I'll pay for. I mean, not he would not accept the gift from Abu Bakr. The ulama just talked a lot about this. Why did the Prophet ﷺ said, buy, I would pay for it? Because this is, this hijrah, the hijrah, the action of hijrah by itself, the act of hijrah, is one of the greatest things that a human being will do. To leave everything behind and to go for the sake of Allah, to change your place, to change your home, to leave everything behind that you've ever built and you've ever owned and to go for the sake of Allah. That is the best act. And the Prophet wanted, it, wanted to have that. And he wanted to pay for his own right to have that hijrah. The hadith about the intention, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That's one of three hadith that really constitutes the basics of jurisprudence, of, of fiqh. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Right? You know the rest of this hadith? The rest of this hadith is all about examples of hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ said, those who make hijrah to a wealth that they're seeking, that's what their hijrah is for. Those who make hijrah to marry a woman, to, to you know, change place of living because they want to be with someone, that's, what the, that's the reward they get, is be with someone. And those who make hijrah for the sake of Allah, then that's, that's fi sabilillah. That is the real, true hijrah. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to pay for the price of the camel that he was going to ride on, on that hijrah. So Aisha said, فَجَهَّزْنَاهُمَا أَحَثَّ الْجِهَازِ We prepared the two camels in the best way possible. And... وَصَنَعْنَا لَهُمَا سُفْرَ A sufr, safar is a journey, travel. Uh, and sufra is whatever you take with you when you travel. It's, uh, it's the, 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 the food that you take with you to, to give you enough until you, you reach your destination. And then she said, My sister Asma, فَقَطَعَتْ أَسْمَاءُ بِنْتُ أَبِي بَكْرْ قِطْعَةً مِنْ نِطَاقِهَا فَرَبَطَتْ فِيهِ عَلَى فَمِ الْجُرَابِ فَبِذَلِكَ سُمِّيَتْ ذَاتُ النِطَاقَيْن you know, the sack, the jurab, where they put the food and, and all the travel package in there. They, they had nothing to wrap around it to close 
the, 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 that bag, that sack. So Asma took her belt and she tore it into two. And she took one of them and that's how she uh, tied up the baggage of the Prophet ﷺ and her father. And she was given the title that Nitaqain. This is honor. This is all about remembering everybody's single little role in this great historical event, in that journey. So she was called the one with the two belts. She took one belt and made it two. One put it back on her dress, and the other one she tied it up to make to to just close the sack for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that's just the translation. So that was the night. That was the noon, that's when the Prophet wasallam. see the Prophet did not give Abu Bakr, even Abu Bakr, did not know that this is happening until the day of, at noon. Until the day of the journey, the day just before they left the house. And at that night, the pagans of Quraysh were trying to get ready to kill the Prophet wasallam. At that night, the Prophet ﷺ chose his cousin, Ali radiallahu an, to sleep in his bed, instead of the Prophet ﷺ, according to uh, Ibn Hisham. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to leave the house, and around that time, the... Uh, Pagans and those young people with their swords were gathering around the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In uh, Ibn Hisham again, this is all from the book of history uh, of the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet left the house in front of them, and they could not see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he took dust and he threw the dust on their heads one by one. And they could not see how the Prophet ﷺ left. And he was reciting, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدَّةً وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدَّةً فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And after that, they continued to wait with the, around the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And every time they peek through the, uh, to the house and they see if the Prophet was still there or not, and they would see Ali. Radiallahu an is right is there and sleeping there, and they would think that the Prophet ﷺ was there. Now Ali had a mission to do after sleeping in the in the bed of the Prophet ﷺ, and another act of sacrifice. Now these people could crash into the house of the Prophet ﷺ, and they may stab Ali right there in the bed. They might kill Ali radiallahu an. Another act of sacrifice radiallahu an. He would put his life before his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And right as the break of dawn, they, Ali gets up, wants to get ready for salah, for fajr, and they look there and that's not Muhammad. That is his cousin Ali radiallahu an. And they said, where is the pra- where is Muhammad? And he said, I don't know. And he did not know. Ali radiallahu an did not know where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left to. Well, the Prophet ﷺ left south instead of heading north. Medina, Yathrib is north of Mecca. The Prophet headed south. And the way that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to, to leave is to mislead the posse, mislead those who chase him. He went to a mountain called the Mount of Thawr, which is south of Mecca. And they, him and Abu Bakr went into a uh, cave known as the Ghar of Thawr, which is towards the direction of Yemen. Now they wanted to go north, they headed towards the direction of Yemen. Now before the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca, just for the details as it is narrated, he went from his house to Abu Bakr's house. From Abu Bakr's house, it is narrated and documented that he left from a back door. 
Now this is, you see all the, the planning and all the, the secrecy that is involved in this whole journey. So he goes through the back door of the, of the house of Abu Bakr, and then he leaves. And the Mount of Thawr is five miles south of Mecca. Five miles, the Prophet wasallam he would go and he would uh, walk in the middle of the night, right before the break of dawn, to reach that mountain. The Prophet wasallam this is narrated in Al-Bayhaqi, he was walking and he would see Abu Bakr walking a little bit in front of him, and then a little bit behind him. He would walk a little bit in the front, and a little bit in the back. And the Prophet uh, wondered about the behavior of Abu Bakr. He said, Abu Bakr, why are you doing this? You go run in the front, and you go to the back. So Abu Bakr, he would say, Ya Rasulullah, أَذْكُرُ الطَّلَبْ فَأَمْشِي خَلْفَكَ I remember those who might be chasing you, so I go behind you. So if they want to face somebody, they would face me first. But then I remember those that might be hiding, waiting for you. So I go behind, I go in front of you to scout the road for you. This is how Abu Bakr felt, how he wanted to protect the Prophet ﷺ. They reached the cave, and Abu Bakr said to the Prophet ﷺ, you shall not enter before I come before you. If there is something in that cave, then I would, ha- I would, I would, ex- I would make sure it's, a, it's fine before I go in there. He said, in kana fihi shay'un asabani dunak. So he walked in there, and he would put his hand in every little hole, and that cave to make sure there are no scorpions and there are no snakes that might hurt the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he uh, explored the cave, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered, and the Prophet sat down and he slept uh, close to Abu uh, Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr, uh, as is narrated in, uh, in in Ibn Hisham. The, the Prophet ﷺ put his head on, uh, on Abu Bakr's thigh and he slept. And Abu Bakr put his foot in a hole to uh, make sure that it, nothing comes from that hole. And during that time, the, uh, an insect or a scorpion bit Abu Bakr. And he was in an enormous amount of pain and he, his, a tear dropped down and fell on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what happened Abu Bakr? And he said, I was bitten. And the Prophet ﷺ wiped the area of bite with his own saliva, and he was cured with one of the many miracles that will happen during this particular journey. In that cave, they slept three days. And they had a full plan that was executed by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ and mostly the family of Abu Bakr to make sure that no one could reach the Prophet and Abu Bakr. Now, the, the pagans of Quraysh, once they knew that the Prophet left and Ali radiallahu anh, was in his house, they went absolutely mad. They went absolutely crazy. And they made an emergency reward. Whomever brings Muhammad this is literally dead or alive, gets a hundred camels. A hundred camels is a wealth. It's wealth. It's like guaranteed wealth for the rest of your life. That's what it is. When you have a hundred camels, you will know no poverty in Arabia forever. That's it. Because these camels are going to have more you know, calves and, and they'll produce and you'll always have milk and Wool and all of that, this is a wealth of people. So, for people. So they said, whomever brings Muhammad, dead or alive, they get a hundred camels. And everyone was looking for the Prophet wasallam before he gets too far from Mecca. The way that his place of hiding was kept secret, that the Prophet wasallam would uh, get the servant of Abu Bakr, his name was Amr ibn Fuhayra. Amr was a shepherd, and the shepherd leads a herd of sheep, right? So, what Amr did that particular day, that particular night, when the Prophet left Mecca and went to Thawr, Amr took all his sheep behind the Prophet and Abu Bakr, so the tracks, the footsteps and the tracks that the Prophet left, was all wiped out with the tracks of all these sheep. And it was well known that sheep would go and and uh, they will graze in those areas. 
So when people were, tra- you know, the, tracking people was an art. It's a profession in Mecca. So all of these tracking people were running around they're trying to find the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ and the, the tracks of him and, and Abu Bakr. So Amr would go and he would walk his sheep right behind the Prophet and Abu Bakr and he would erase and wipe every trace of the Prophet ﷺ. And he would take all his uh, sheep towards Thawr, towards that mount of Thawr, and the Prophet and Abu Bakr will have fresh milk from the sheep, and he would take him back to Mecca. And the majority of the disbelievers of the, of the kuffar, they were trying to really go to the roots to Yathrib. That's where the Muslims are. And that's the, where the Prophet, ﷺ, Prophet ﷺ most likely is going to go. So most of their search was concentrated north. And most of those who are the, the, what do they call them, the reward hunters, uh, they were trying to go and find the Prophet ﷺ in that neighborhood. But the Prophet ﷺ was down there. And uh, Asma radiallahu anha and Ali radiallahu an, they were both ex- exposed to abuse. Ali was taken and he was beaten. And he uh, was uh, pr- imprisoned to, to maybe he would confess. I would say interrogate, you know, he was interrogated, enhanced interrogation. And uh, he was uh, beaten severely to confess and to tell him why the Prophet ﷺ. But this is, you know, the plan, the Prophet didn't tell them, didn't tell Ali, or didn't tell Asma that they were going to Gartha. They didn't know. And if you don't know something, you can't tell it. <laughs> so. Quraysh found out soon that Ali is not going not gonna to be able to tell him anything. He really did not know. He knew the Prophet ﷺ left. He didn't know where the Prophet ﷺ is. Now Asma, they went there to interrogate her. So they knock on the door of the house of Abu Bakr. She comes out. And they said, where are you? Where is your father? And she said, لا أدري والله أين أبي. She, made, you know, she gave him a vow. Wallahi, I don't know where my father is. Didn't know. So Abu Bakr take his hand and he slap her right in the face. Abu Abu Jahl, astaghfirullah. Yeah, what did I say, Abu Bakr? Abu Jahl slapped the daughter of Abu Bakr. And her ears, her earring broke and she started bleeding from her ear. This is how mean and vicious this man was. Hit a girl and trying to get that information from her. So they tried to start looking for the Prophet ﷺ. And they looked everywhere. And they actually arrived to the cave of Thaw. They looked in every little hole and in every little mount. And eventually they actually the posse arrived at that mount of Thaw. And they went to that cave, to the cave of Thaw. Al Bukhari narrated on the authority of Anas, on the authority of Abu Bakr himself radiallahu an, he said, Kuntu ma'an fi al-ghar. I was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the cave. Farafatu ra'si fa'idha ana bi'aqdami qawm. I lift my head and I see the, their feet. You know, the cave is down and, and the, the opening of the cave is up there. And he looks up and he sees the, the feet of those who are chasing them. And he said, he whispered to the Prophet ﷺ, قُلْتُ يَا نَبِيَّ اللَّهِ لَوْ أَنَّ بَعْضَهُمْ طَأْطَأَ بَصَرَهُ رَآنَا If someone just lowered their face and looked inside, he would see us. It's over. They die. You know, they're going to kill them right there. And, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said, إِسْكُتْ أَبَا بَكْرُ Be quiet, Abu Bakr. إِثْنَانِ اللَّهُ ثَالِثَهُمَا We are two. How about two people? And Allah is the third. And in another riwayah, ما ظنك أبا بكر? What do you think, Abu Bakr? اثنين الله ثالثهما. Two and the third is Allah. And as Abu Bakr was tearing in one narration, he said, لا تحزن. Do not be sad. إن الله معنا. Allah is indeed with us. And Allah subhanahu wa taala in Surah At-Tawbah, verse verse forty. Allah says exactly what happened in that cave. 
إلا تنصروه فقد نصره الله إذ أخرجه الذين كفروا ثاني اثنين إذ هما في الغار إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن إن الله معنا فأنزل الله سكينته عليه وأيده بجنود لم تروها وجعل كلمة الكلمة الذين كفروا السفلى وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم. If you help him not, for Allah did indeed help him. When the disbelievers drove him out, the second of the two, when they were in the cave, he said to his companion, meaning Abu Bakr, be not afraid, be not sad. Surely Allah is with us. Then Allah sent down his tranquility upon him and strengthened him with forces which you saw not and made the word of those who disbelieved the lowermost. While the word of Allah is the uppermost. And Allah is almighty, all wise. In some of the uh, miracles that happen, and this one of one of the greatest miracles that Allah said in Tawbah, that they could not see. They did not see the Prophet wasallam in that cave. How about the spider and the dove? the famous thing. Well, the spider is narrated in the books of history. The, that, that the a spider came and uh, uh, w- w- yeah, made a web, weaved the web right at the, at the cave. And that is actually not only in, in Ibn Hisham, but also in Musnad Ahmed, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. And that's one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pagans looked at, at the opening of the cave and they saw this web of the spider weaved, you know. And they said, well, if anyone got in there, this, they would have broken that web and there's no one there and they went back. Uh, the, uh, the idea of a dove laying two eggs in there uh, at, the, at the opening of the cave is, is actually very weak narration. The miracle of Allah can come in many different shapes of forms. I mean, they were right there at the cave. They, if they just looked under the feet, they would see the Prophet wasallam and Abu Bakr, and they did not. Now, what does that tell us? What is the lesson in all of that? You rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, you do your part. And even with all of that, Whatever you planned may not happen. See how many precautions the Prophet and Abu Bakr took for them not to find them. For the pagans not to find Abu Bakr and not to find the Prophet wasallam. They, they really found them. They went there. They got to the cave. But who protected them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do what you can. But if whatever asbab you're trying, whatever reasons, whatever precautions you're trying to take, it didn't happen... Don't you panic. And don't be sad. Because the one who you relied upon was not the hiding. You were not relying on Amir ibn Fuhayra taking his sheep. You were not relying on, on uh, being in a cave south while people trying to look for you on the road north. You were relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's you see the best of creation Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is completely unshaken. When Abu Bakr looked at their feet and he started, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, that's it. I mean, they found us. And the Prophet was completely calm. You see that? Ya Abu Bakr. يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِي لَا تَحْزَن Don't you worry. مَا ظَنُّكَ بِثْنَيْنِ اللَّهُ ثَالِثَهُمَا What do you think about two and Allah is the third there? The one who we rely on is still there. No matter what happens, that's the comfort. And that's the strength that we have. Is it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After three days, no trace of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Three days is very well documented in many hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and in others. That three nights, 
is the, is the number of nights that the Prophet ﷺ stayed in there. After that, uh, and during those three days, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari, Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu an, he was the one that would actually, he would be the only one that knew where the Prophet ﷺ and the Messenger, along with Amr ibn Fuhayra and Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, which were not, they were not suspected by, by Quraysh. Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr was a young person, was in his early teens at that time. And sometimes he was 12 or 13. So Quraysh did not think that that huge secret would be with that little boy. With a, you know, he was just barely getting into his adolescence. And he knew. See how Islam was on the shoulders of many, many young people. And how you can trust young people with some of the most important secrets if they were worthy of it. And Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr was, he was the one that would go sleep in Mecca, he would hear all the news, he would know where the posses are, and he would come and tell his father and the Prophet wasallam for three days. So after three nights, the guide came. And the guide was actually a, a pagan person, he was not a Muslim. He uh, was uh, Abdullah ibn Urayqit al-Layfi. Abdullah ibn Urayqit, he was uh, a man. He, was, uh, he, was, he knew exactly how, he knew, uh, how to uh, navigate his way through the desert. He was a well-known desert guide. And that's who the Prophet ﷺ chose. What is that? Where is the lesson in that? You, do the, you choose the best person for the job. If you can trust them. Now, the, there are probably some Muslims that travel. I mean, Muslims travel north and south and they lead caravans and do, they do all of these things. But the one that really knows the road, and the Prophet did not want to take the, the known caravan roads, right? He wanted to go to a different route. He wanted a really good guide. And the best guide that was available was not a Muslim. And that's who the Prophet ﷺ chose. So if you have a job, that even a non-Muslim would be the best person for the job. And that's the person that needs to be hired. That's what should happen. That's how the ulama you know, concluded from this particular position. Is there many Muslims that maybe would have done, but not as good. As, as this particular person. And the Prophet wasallam chose him, and it was in Al-Bukhari, وَهُوَ عَلَى دِينِ كُفَّارِ قُرَيْشِ And he was on the religion of the pagans of Quraysh. فَأَمَّنَاهِ They trusted him. فَدَفَعَا إِلَيْهِ رَاحِلَتَيْهِمَا The camels were with this man. The camels were not parked at the, at the bottom of the Mount of Thawr. The camels were given to that man before the journey. And he was taking care of the camels. After three nights, there was an appointment that he would come and pick the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr from the cave and then take him to Medina. And that's exactly what he did. So she said, Aisha radiallahu anha in this hadith in Al-Bukhari, فَأَتَاهُمَا بِرَاحِ لِتَيْهِمَا He brought the two camels, صُبْحَ ثَلَاثِ In the morning of the third night, and انطَلَقَ مَعَهُمَا عَامِرُ بْنُ فُحَيْرَ وَالدَّلِيلِ So there were four people. Abdullah ibn Uraiqit, Amr ibn Fuhayra, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's when they left. And now they're headed north. And she said, وَأَخَذَ بِهِمْ طَرِيقَ السَّوَاحِلِ They went towards the sea. So now they went first south, and now they headed west. Uh, right? <laughs> towards the seaside. Again, they're trying to take a completely different route from any known route of Quraysh that, uh, that, uh, that connects Mecca and Yathrib. So now they went towards the seaside, the seashore. I would, uh, inshallah, stop here and uh, we have about five minutes to open uh, the, the floor for any questions or comments because we want to spend some time with the Prophet wasallam and Abu Bakr during that journey, during the route between Mecca. Now we studied how they left their house in Mecca 
and we will inshallah in the next session spend time with them on their route on their journey from Mecca to Medina so any uh, yes Jazakallah Right. Right. The uh, what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited as he was leaving his house? Uh, he recited a verse from Surah Yasin. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And we put a veil before them and a veil behind them. And we blinded them so they see not. And they could not see the Prophet ﷺ leaving his own house. Which ayah? Anybody has a mushaf? In the beginning, yeah. It's a third of... Yeah, in Surah Yasin. Al Mamal Kita. It is verse 9. Verse 9 of Surah Yasin, chapter 36. Jurab is, uh, is like a sack. It's a, made of leather. Uh, Jurab in the slang Arabic now and in known Arabic is a socks. It's a sock. But that's not what it means. It's pro- at that time. Jurab uh, is not a sock. It's probably the same thing in Urdu, right? Jurab is a sock. In Arabic now, in the Modern Arabic is different from Quranic and classic Arabic. A little bit. I mean, there's some differences. And jurab definitely doesn't mean a sock at, at that time. It is, uh, it is sort of a sack. And it, it, is, uh, it is a sack that you have to tie it up in the top. Uh, and, and that's what they used to take with them too. That's their suitcases. That's how they saved their food and all of that. Yes? The comparison nowadays between situation of uh, when they want to inform the house of the Prophet and uh, uh, the present day uh, leaders that are present in our country. And uh, one of the scholars of Islam, he said that the, uh, the uh, Abu, Abu Jahl, or Abu Hakam at that time was known, uh, when he was asked, Are we going to kill the Prophet And then Abu, uh, Abu Jahl answered, then, what do you think we're going to do? Then they said, let, then let us and let us storm the house and kill him uh, with one hit. All of us will kill him with one hit. Then uh, Abu Jahl said, أَتُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَقُولَ الْعَرَبِ أَنَّ أَبَا الْحَكَمْ رَوَّعَ آلَ مُحَمَّدْ Do you want that the Arabs to say uh, that Abu Jahl, who at that time was named his name was Abu Hayy, he called him the Abu uh, Hakim, that he terrorized the family of Muhammad. Uh, and nowadays, if you compare our leaders, that if they really want one person, uh, then they not only will storm his house, they will storm the entire neighborhood. So the scholars they say that the the uh, the kufr of Abu Jahl was even more merciful with the Muslims than the uh, Leadership and the 
space on them until he comes out. So he won't terrorize the family of her mom. So <laughs> Abu Jal had more mercy <laughs> with the family of Muhammad than our leaders, the Muslim leaders, right? With our family. A disclaimer, you know, the opinions made in this comments do not present. <laughs> Don't get me in trouble. Don't get me in trouble, man. <laughs> do not represent present the opinions of Masjid al Salam or the Muslim Society of Memphis. <laughs> subhanallah. Yeah, subhanallah. Okay, well, it's time for Aisha, inshallah. With that, we conclude. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a bleat. And, th- and that's not in Abu Ha'i, this is in Ibn Hisham. That this was, uh, that Iblis himself wanted to, uh, okay. to make sure uh, that this, is, uh, this happens. He was in a meeting with the other shayateen. And uh, by the way, there was no, the, the, the people that uh, were in that meeting, all their names are there, uh, and none of them uh, become a Muslim. Not one, in, not one person in that meeting. They all died in Kufr. The majority of them died in Badr. All, all, all 11 names in that meeting that conspired to kill the Prophet wasallam, Allah gave him no guidance. Abu Sufyan was not there. Abu Sufyan was not in that particular... Uh, it was not chosen in, in that particular... Uh, the, the 11 that were chosen, they were, chose 11 people. And of them was Abu Jahl, Hakam ibn al As, Uqabat ibn Abu Mu'ayt, Dadr ibn al-Harith, Umayya ibn Khalaf, Zam'at ibn al-Aswad, Tu'ayma ibn Adi, Abu Lahab himself, Ubayy ibn Khalaf, and Nubayh wa Munabbih ibn al-Hajjar. They all, yeah, I mean, Cheney was in there. And I know we're going to get in trouble somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Assalamu alaikum.